much, dear friends. Uh, it was, in fact, a very rich conference uh, with great quality in the conversation, so I have not the illusion of being able to make a complete summary. In fact, some of the conversations, they should go on, I think. Nevertheless, I will, on a very personal basis, try to make here a summary of some takeaways uh, from this conference, at least some of the takeaways that I will take with me. I think it was common to many of the interventions, the idea of trust. And that to have trust, we need to have meaningful relationships. To build effective coalitions, we need to invest in relationships. The human factor was present in different panels. The idea to invest in people, the idea that technology is critically important, but technology will not substitute the need for personal interaction so that we can build trust among ourselves and the trust necessary to extend this kind of coalitions, coalitions for change. So meaningful relationships, effective coalitions, productive networks based on trust. We have mentioned, among many other points, the role of women. Namely, there was a very inspiring uh, presentation on the role of women in terms of coding, the success of women to science, mathematics, and other technologies, science and technology. And uh, we have also seen that it is important in this trust-building process, time. It was, I was quite impressed by the insistence of some, many speakers on the issue of time, including in this last panel, where there was the question, what are we doing here between Europe and Africa? Is it a short-term meeting, or is it for the long term? I could even try to put it a little bit more sexy. Is it uh, between Europe and Africa? Is it a one-night stand, <laughs> or is it a long-term, serious relationship? Time is of the essence. We cannot have a serious relationship among ourselves or among Europe and Africa. If you think that it's only, by the way, the President of the Republic also insists on that, just to have a flash, and then we go each other part. We have to have time and to have a perspective of time. And you even mentioned during our conference that others try to have also a more strategic relationship. So I insist on this. Human capital, human relationship, meaningful relationship, but also with the perspective of time. Then in different areas, we spoke about some conditions for development. I would say mainly two, infrastructure, Africa needs better infrastructure, and education. I've been very involved in some projects for education in Africa, even recently after I left the European Commission. I was in a commission where there were leaders and former leaders. In fact, it was coordinated by Gordon Brown, former Prime Minister of Britain, but with some Africans, including, for instance, President Kikwete from Tanzania and others. And we have presented um, a report on education, global education, to the Secretary General of the United Nations. It was still uh, the former present uh, Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And, uh, and one of the conclusions we have reached in that uh, research, it was really first class, funded by the way, among others by the Norway government, was that in the investment in education in terms of development aid is in fact much, much less important than in other areas. For instance, I'm not saying that it's perfect, but health receives much, much more aid than um, education. Why? Obviously, because if there is a health crisis, we can see the results. By the way, we have seen it in the, the issue of Ebola, for instance, with considerable success. While to invest in education today, it takes some years to see the results. So that explains why the public uh, investment on education is in fact minor compared to many other areas and I think that's one of the problems we have with, with Africa because without education it's impossible to have 
real sustainable development. And if you look at the countries that are the most, evo uh, um, the most let's say, modern and the most successful, the most greater prosperity in the world, for instance, the Scandinavian Nordic countries, what do they have in common? Or some countries in Southeast Asia that were probably the greatest success in terms of development, they have in common three factors, education, infrastructure, and rule of law. Rule of law is critically important. That was not the topic one today, uh, but I think we should insist on that because investors need confidence. So they have to know that if there is a contract that is not respected, that there will be means of redress that situation. So I consider as critical, indispensable conditions for long-term prosperity, education, infrastructure, and rule of law. There were some comments about trade, and uh, including some ministers, they mentioned how important it could be to have an African free trade area. As you know, it was recently approved, and most African governments accepted the idea, and they committed to work for an African free trade area. But we also heard the comments saying that, for instance, between, let's say, Morocco and Algeria, the communication is almost non-existent. So in fact, I think this is one of the problems that is putting obstacles to the growth and development of, their, of Africa. The lack of a dimension in terms of regional integration or at least the continental integration. Because we need that dimension so that it can attract the most, let's say, serious long-term investment. Because that was also said during the sessions today, there are many people that want to invest. The real problem today in the world is not the problem of lack of capital. It's exactly the opposite. Also because of my current capacities, I can tell you that the real issue today is not the lack of capital. There is probably too much capital. The problem is this capital is trying to find the right ideas. Where are we going to invest? Where can we invest so that we can have some, of course, legitimate return and that we are sure that our investment has a good probability to bring some return. And this is why it is extremely important, I come back to this again, the investment on education and social and human capital. Without that, we will not get the necessary capital that, of course, is needed for Africa and other parts of the world. We also mentioned here, in, namely in the institutional panels with the ministers that we invited, the problems about political cooperation and political institutional cooperation between Africa and the European Union, namely the fact that now there is a discussion about uh, what is going to be the future global agreement, the umbrella agreement between Europe and the African countries. You know, today it is Europe and ACP, African, Caribbean and Pacific. And there is a discussion going on if it should not be primarily Europe, Africa. While I was in the commission, let me share that experience with you. As you know, we have put a lot of emphasis on Europe, Africa relationship because we really believe that it's a natural relationship to establish and to deepen. And in fact, we had here there, was, there had been one in, in Egypt before, but we had here in Lisbon the Euro-African Summit at official level, Euro-African. I personally believe, but that's a very personal opinion, that we have, of course, to continue and to deepen the relationship also with Caribbean and Pacific countries, but Africa, because of its so complex and important problems and challenges, and also for the specific interest it has for Europe, it, sh it should be now time to establish a structured cooperation between Africa and the European Union as such. But I was quite happy during this day because we almost have not heard the word aid. It's interesting. Some years ago, I'm sure that we are, will be hearing a lot of the word aid because people are now more confident that besides the so-called over ODA, Overseas Development Assistant, or Cooperation for Development, that of course it should continue, I think we all agree, namely in humanitarian cases. We need long-term investment, public investment, but also private investment. And a lot of the speakers, they focus on the need to have this private sector involvement, including, and that is already now a reality, investment of private sector, African private sector, in Africa and African private sector in Europe. 
we also have to think both ways. So there is, in fact, a willingness to have a more balanced relationship. And the word respect was mentioned. I think most of you remember, at least it was my generation, the, very, the great American singer, uh, Afro-American singer, what is Redding, and also Rita Frank Leyev, all I need is some respect. It's one of the very beautiful songs of Afro-American music. All I need is some respect. And so I sense in the intervention of many of you here, and also the ministers, that they really want to deepen a more deep um, relationship between Africa and Europe based on the principle of respect, of reciprocity. The word was also used. Reciprocity, but respect, and a more balanced relationship that will include the social capital, social innovation, but also a more active private sector. For that, I continue to insist we need trade, trade facilitation, and we need education, uh, infrastructure, and a rule of law. We have mentioned, but I will not repeat, of course, that now we see Africa also in terms of opportunities. I think today we should try to avoid the old image of the, what was called Afro-pessimism. Yes, there are problems, and the Illegal migration is putting that pressure today, uh, for instance, in the discussion between Europe and Africa. But the, the dynamics of demography in Africa are going to make Africa one of the more important continents of the world, also as a possible market. The dynamism of demography, the dynamism of Africans, the creativity, the resilience, the capacity of sacrifice that Africans have shown in the past, I really believe, and I'm not saying that just politically, you know, I'm no longer in official capacity, so my sincerity is growing day by day. <laughs> so I'm now saying what I very much believe, and I've been in more than 31 countries in Africa, not only in the Lusophone countries, since the 80s of last century, when I was a very young uh, deputy foreign minister and state uh, secretary for cooperation. And so I was quite impressed to see the dynamism for instance, of small markets in Africa, small markets, that dynamism. If we could somehow work to give more structure, more management, more predictability to this extraordinary dynamism that we find in Africa, I'm completely sure that Africa can be one of the richest continents in the future. I really believe, on, believe that. And believe that, in fact, with or without the word leapfrogging, I understood there are some disagreements about that word, but there, is, there are no doubts that in some areas, technology is allowing uh, Africans to go faster, so to, to climb the steps faster than it was possible or usually assumed some years ago. I think it was also important, the insistence of some of you in terms of the success stories, we need to have some success stories. Storytelling is important, positive narratives of Africa. And the best thing is the examples, because there are good and not so good examples, but we need to invest on those good examples. And I think for Europe, it's of course an issue of self-interest, so-called enlightened self-interest. It's a question of humanitarian interest, but also self-interest, because where are we going to look for the growth in the future? Asia is now being gr growing consistently, most of the countries for some years. It's more mature now. But the greatest reserve of growth in the world in the future, I think, will come from Africa. And so when we are involved in Africa, Europeans can do it because they like it, because they love it, because of cultural or historic or many other reasons. But I think, at least from a private sector point of view, it is also important to think about the common and the reciprocal interest of Europeans and Africans to be together. To conclude, uh, what can we do now from here? I already mentioned when I was welcoming the Portuguese President of the Republic, the word complicity. I really believe that we need some kind of complicity between Africans and Europeans in this world. Globalization is there. Some people are predicting globalization is going to disappear because of the rise of nationalism, nativism, protectionism, xenophobia, and so on and so forth. I don't think so. I think that what we are seeing today is a resistance. And there is resistance because there is movement. But if I ask you, 
where do you think we are going to be 10 or 20 years from now? Are we going to have more or less trade exchanges? Are we going to have more or less cross-border investment? 10 or 20 years from now, are we going to have more or less international travel, tourism? Are we going to have more or less cross-border investment? Are we going to have more or less uh, communications through uh, uh, communication technology or social media? More or less interaction, international? I think we are going to have more. So there is today a, a fight between flux, the flux of communication, and friction. At the end, I believe flux will overcome friction. But we are in a very specific moment of reaction. Globalization, also on the inequality, and the perception of growing inequality, in many cases not just a perception, has created reactions in our countries, from the United States to Europe, but you see also the nationalism tone in some Af uh, Asian countries. Um, and people, when they see that globalization, they tend to close, to react closing. And so it's a question, who is going to win? The negative attitudes of closing or of opening? And for that, I think Europe needs Africa, and Africa needs Europe. Because in the world of globalization, what is the message we convey to our children? We can convey basically two. The world outside is very dangerous. Let's hide. Let's protect ourselves. The world is dangerous. Or we can say, look, there are great opportunities there. Embrace change. Embrace modernization. Embrace the opportunities of a connected, interconnected world. Of course, there are risks. But there are rewards as well. So this is a fundamental cultural issue that we are discussing today in Europe. And it's not a theoretical academic issue. It's a question of survival of Europe and European model. Are we going to remain open or are we going to close ourselves? I think it's so important, this. And that's why the connection of Europe with Africa can be critical uh, for the future. That's why we need this complicity. And diaspora is a good example. Because we here, we are, took the uh, initiative, and I'd like to congratulate, of course, Philippe Poton and all the team. Uh, they've made a great work. But this, uh, we have the Conseil de Diaspora Portuguesa. It's a network, not very big, it's a small network of Portuguese that are all over the world, and that have attained some positions of relevance in academia, in business, uh, in um, uh, many areas of social areas, and so on. And we built that network. But most of the countries, African countries, they have very important diasporas as well. And some of them, by the way, very success successful. So I think this idea of network is fundamental. So what I'd like to see coming out of this meeting will be the establishment of network a euro african network. Not a very ambitious thing about the community or no, no. A network between Europe and the Africans. People that know each other or try to know each other over time. And they try to build that relationship, putting together political leaders, business leaders, social leaders, activists, people that can give a contribution, young people. President Marcel made to me a challenge saying that I should bring more young people, and I promise I will bring, because in fact I also teach at university here and in other countries. So I think we can bring next time much more young people uh, than at least myself to this uh, debate. So the idea for me now to follow on is to have this capacity of creating among ourselves and beyond a network, a network that is not, not too big, Pas la machine à gas, pas, not everything, but based on some people that we can establish to have useful co uh, conversation and to come with this message to, global, to the global community. Because I really believe on the capacity of blending, of um, miscegenation, and in fact, in the last panel, people were saying that we need stories showing how important is diaspora and this special relationship between Africa and Europe. Today at 7 p.m., we are going to watch, at least most of us, a match between France and Belgium. Most of the players are African, <laughs> European and African, and they are among the best in the world precisely because of that. Why? Now, let me make a little bit chauvinist. Why is European football today the best in the world? Because we were able to receive people from over the world, from Africa to Latin America. And they are Europeans, of course, but they are Europeans. As Lukaku now said, he said, now when I go in Belgium, nobody asks for my identification. <laughs> People know me. So that's a, just an example, football. But there are many others where the fact that we are together, it brings value. It does not destroy value. 
the xenophobics, the racists, they say that destroys value. That what is not pure is not so good. It's exactly opposite. What is more complex in this very complex world, a higher degree of variety increases our possibility of success in dealing with change. Because I believe in this idea of a global cooperation. And let me just conclude with this point. Have you seen what happened today? Today we are finally, those 12 boys and this coach were taken out of the caves. And what I liked in that story, a true story in Thailand, was that all the world was following almost life every step. That's interesting because it's about globalization. It's not about what was happening here in the village next to us. No, it was in Thailand. It's not exactly right here. But at least I think most of us were feeling about the future of those 12 boys as if it was almost people from our family. What can happen? And we are very happy that they were now out of those caves and that was a great uh, international rescue operation. So what I mean by this is that we can embrace globalization and at the same time care about concrete people. Because we should not do like that personage of Dostoevsky who said, Dostoevsky said, there was, that was a person that loved mankind in general, but hated every individual in particular. <laughs> now, that's not the kind of... When people speak to me about mankind, man, mankind is a very abstract concept. What we have to think when we speak about mankind is a concrete man, woman, or child. This is mankind. And when we have the success of this operation based on concrete people, I think we understand better what is going on. So let's make this contribution for a concept of mankind that is based not on a state or a group of states, but on the respect for the fundamental dignity of each human being. And let's give a modest cooperation, building a good network of confidence and trust between Europe and Africa. We just started. That was the first step. I hope other steps will follow. Thank you very much for your cooperation.